Why is it some marriages work and many fall apart? What does it take to have a harmonious, long-lasting relationship? Learn what marital research-based methods can teach us about successful marriages, and if you need it, what could save yours? Next on Living Smart. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. Dr. Donald Cold, a Lutheran minister, received his doctorate with a specialization in psychotherapy in 1993. He has 25 years of experience working with individuals and couples in various capacities, including marital therapy and affair recovery. He's been trained by researcher Dr. John Gottman, who has studied innovative ways to help couples strengthen and heal their relationships based on research findings. Contrary to popular belief, there's much more to a solid, emotionally intelligent marriage than effective communication. Today we'll explore what it takes to make a marriage well work. Welcome to Living Smart, Dr. Thank Cole. Thank you for having me. Pleasure now, to be here. When we hear research-based therapy, what exactly does that mean? One of the things that you can find if you go into the average bookstore, go through all the books on relationships, most of those are written by people who have good ideas about what a marriage, good marriage would be. Uh, a lot of it written by therapists who have worked with a lot of troubled marriages, and then they kind of extrapolate from there about what a good marriage is. And sometimes your ideas are really good, sometimes not so good. Right. Uh, what research-based therapy is, um, is we've started by looking at couples, both couples who are having problems and couples who are succeeding, and finding the differences and looking for ways to strengthen the couples who are struggling to be more like the couples who are succeeding. Okay. Now, we always hear communication, 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 but, but, but the Gottman method, it's more than that. It's funny. Uh, if you think of communication in this way, um, I'll be generous with myself. About 50% of the time, I am ready to communicate with my wife, right. and 50% not. And she's about the same. 50% of the time, she's ready to communicate with me. 50% of the time, she's not. Well, if we multiply those two together, that means we are communicating well, about 25% of the time. Exactly. So miscommunication is more the norm than we think. It happens all the time. And many programs have been out there struggling to help couples be better communicators with only limited success. Uh, what we've learned is it's not so much being a good communicator as being good at understanding and repairing our miscommunications. Very good point, very good point. Now, you chose this type of therapy as opposed to all the other stuff that's out there. Why did you choose something different? And you're doing it with your wife. You're teaching these courses with your wife. We're teaching together, and we're, we, we do therapy uh, in the same office, and I enjoy working with her in that way. Um, years ago, I became aware that most of the people I talked to in a one-on-one -on -one situation in the therapy office, especially the men I talked to, were mainly talking about their struggles in their relationships. Uh, when a man is coming in, he's depressed, he's upset, he said, well, what is upsetting you? Well, it's my problems with my wife. Right. So I began over time to really focus on how to be more helpful to these people. And I tried different things from different ideas and authors and so on. Uh, back in the mid-90s, I began reading uh, Dr. Gottman's work and it just resonated with me. I think it resonated with something that goes way back into my childhood about uh, let's look and see what really is instead of just grabbing hold of something that we wish it were. Right. Uh, so that idea of the research based uh, really grabbed hold of me and the methods that have grown out of that uh, seem to really be effective with the couples uh, with whom I work and that's a, a lot of pleasure for me. Let's talk about the, the four revelations in the Gottman method. Four what they call four horsemen horse revelations horse. that kill relationships. And the first one you have here is criticism. Criticism is where instead of just complaining about something that's bothering me, I kind of launch into attack of my partner's character. Instead of, uh, you know, it bothers me that we're late today. It's like, you're always late. What's wrong with you? Can't you get yourself together? So the, the, the complaint goes way beyond just the complaint, but goes into seeing the problem as a flaw in my partner's 
character. And also, you're using words that, that people use all the time, which is always, mm -hmm. and, and oh. that's an absolute world. Nothing is always, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and these things really hurt communication as well. The, the, it, it, definitely when you say always and right. never, never talk to me or always talk to me or whatever. Those are real clear signs that we're, that we're into criticism. Exactly. And defensiveness is what you have is the second one. And that's kind of a dance that, that uh, goes along with criticism. criticism. When we feel criticized, our normal uh, response is to get defensive. I don't know anyone in probably in the history of marriage who has listened to a list of criticisms from his partner or her partner, and then said, thank you. Thank you for pointing out all my flaws. Now I can be such a, and I'll tell you such what, a better person. I'll be a better person now, <laughs> and that's so helpful to me uh, that what I really want you to do is make a list of, of all, all of my flaws and, and give them to me, and that way I'll be even better. I mean, it's silly. Yeah. When people criticize us, we react defensively. We either whine and think you're being unfair, or we or we lash back and blame them or divert it, you know, well, yeah, I'm late sometimes, but you're always bouncing checks, you know, and so right. we change the subject or something right. to, to kind of cross, you attack, uh, cross you criticize. Attack back. Attack yeah. back. And the funny thing is, criticism does not always uh, start the argument. Sometimes the defensiveness does. I really wish you would hurry. I'm afraid we're going to be late. I'm so tired of you nagging me. So the first may Just, not have been a criticism, but a person gets defensive anyway, and then the criticism, defensiveness uh, Just dance keeps going begins. and going, going. It's a cycle. Stonewalling. Stonewalling is an emotional withdrawal right. from the conflict. Uh, you see, it, it, it kind of looks like this. I'm not going to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Just, I'm, I'm not going to pay attention. And if you, if you get into the mind and interview a person who was stonewalling about what he or she was thinking at that time, they'll say things like, I knew anything I said was just going to make it worse, so I'm not going to say anything. But the partner doesn't get it that way, that they are somehow trying to calm things down when they're in stonewalling. What the partner is usually feeling is a great deal of rejection and pain, and so they don't accept the stonewalling in a, in a good way, but it actually causes the partner to escalate, not to calm down. Mm. The last one is contempt, which is probably happens after all of these things. <clears throat> Bad things happen. Contempt is, in some ways, the 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 most um, toxic of the four. Mm. Um, contempt is when we develop an opinion of our partner and express a, opinions of our partner that they are somehow less than us, that they are unintelligent or stupid, or or that they are just you know why did I ever marry this person? I can't believe. I ever got involved with someone like you. Those kinds of expressions. And when we start thinking about our partner and feeling about our partner in contemptuous ways, the marriage is really in trouble. That's, yeah. Antidotes, now <clears throat> we're gonna talk about solutions because that's what, what we really wanna focus on. Antidotes to the four horsemen. The first one you have gentle complaining. Gentle complaining. And especially when we start up a conversation, because one of the things that the research has taught us is that the first few seconds, like the first 30 seconds of a conversation, will determine to a very high percentage of the time whether that conversation is going to go well or badly. Or badly. Those first few seconds are so important. Uh, so when I have a, something I want to tell my wife that's upsetting me, to think about it a little bit, to talk about it in I terms, what I feel, what I need, uh, not what she is doing wrong or how she's a bad person. So a gentle startup, a gentle complaint like, uh, um, honey, I know we're really busy, but we do need to get out the door. Right. You know, I, I need us to try harder or to I do that or something. Or I feel frustrated because yeah, I feel we're not getting out there. Yeah. yeah. Taking responsibility. Taking responsibility um, helps lower the defensiveness. When we can say, even if our partner, maybe they've gone too far in, in their complaining or, or even gone into criticism, there's usually something behind it. There's usually something I can accept right. in my wife. So if, if, uh, if she's upset because I'm late, I can say, you're right, I do tend to run late sometimes. I'm sorry that's making you stressed. Right. You know, and, and take some responsibility for my part. Uh, and that lowers the, the tendency to get defensive. Right. Do you want to be? Do you want to be right, or do you want to be happy? Do you want to have a good yeah. marriage? Right. Uh, Self-soothing. When people go into that stonewalling mode, one of the things we know, if you put a, a pulse meter on them, 
is that their pulses tend to be racing. Inside, outside, they may be looking uh, really calm, really but... calm, and really like stoic and no feelings. But inside, uh, they're churning a great deal, and you can see that in their pulse rate uh, racing up, usually over 100 beats per minute. And uh, when that's happening, what the person needs to realize is what I really need to do here is catch my breath. Okay. I need to calm myself down physically. Sometimes that actually takes a uh, kind of a structured timeout procedure to, mm -hmm. to help a person uh, get his or her, you know, uh, physical and emotional feet back and under them. The fourth is creating a culture of fondness and admiration. There is no quick fix for contempt. Uh, certainly we don't want to say contemptuous things, but if those things have kind of really started to infect our minds and the way we think about our partner, uh, we have to kind of reverse field. One way of thinking about this is the happy, successful couples, they seem to observe their partner to catch them doing something right, something that makes them feel good so they can talk about that. Okay. Where the unsuccessful couples frequently seem to be just the opposite. They're watching their partner to see them doing something wrong. Watch them fail. So, they can, so then they can gripe about it, complain about it, or think badly of them. It's hard to be contemptuous of a person when you've just spent hours talking about how wonderful you think she is, uh, how, how helpful he is to you, uh, what a good person you think he is. Right. Um, when you create that culture that that's the communication that you have with each other all the time, uh, or most of the time, uh, it becomes very hard to kind of enter into that really negative place of contempt. Yeah, you're focusing on the positive, and, and it's, it's like it's really being, it's hard to be mean to a person that's being nice to you. Mm -hmm. It's basically that, killing them with kindness, well, in other it's, words. It's, it's hard to be mean to a person that you have just been nice to. Exactly, the, exactly. That I've just been thinking about what a wonderful person my wife is, then 10 minutes later to think that she's uh, this terrible thing, you know, beneath my feet. Right. Right. It's just not they just work. don't fit together. You say mostly men stonewall. Why is that? We don't really know kind of definitively the answer to that. And certainly women can stonewall too. Uh, I think that, um, but the, the research does show in heterosexual couples, men do the stonewalling about 85% mm -hmm. of the time. Um, I think it does have something to do with the fact that men have a more active alarm system, generalized alarm system, we're, we're the ones who tend to uh, react to danger um, or, or threat right. more forcefully. And I think that the stonewalling comes out Instead of that, but we're that. not sure. The research is still, we're still working on that. Let's talk about before marriage, because obviously nobody wants to get divorced. Mm -hmm. um, premarital counseling and all that stuff. Other things that you should know before you get married that that are not negotiable for you, whether it's value or money issues, whatever. That would be that would be a wonderful thing if we could do that, if we could help couples identify the things that they have to have, uh, that they can't compromise on. The problem often is that when we're in the premarital situation, we don't really know what those are. Maybe we're kind, maybe it's a, a younger couple. Uh, they haven't really learned what it is that, that is an absolute must for them in life. They so they don't really know themselves they, yet. The, and even if they, they do, when the, the, um, the positive uh, love feelings are there, they're kind of in control. It's like, oh, well, we'll get along. We'll work out any of our differences or problems. And it's hard to take realistically. Um, you know, I just don't think I can live with this. And oftentimes divorces do occur when people come to the place to say, you know, we have a difference here that we just cannot yield on. Um, and, that, and the divorce happens then. But there are basic things like, oh, do you want kids or you don't want kids? I mean, that's ba I know people got married and one of them wanted kids before they got married and the other one didn't before they got married and they still got married. Right, because, of, <laughs> yeah, they don't really accept that. And, and we think we can, like I say, we think we can compromise. We believe our partner loves us. They're going to change. They're going to see it more our way. Uh, and... That's a really good example about having children or not having children. So they get married, and now he's kind of, and, and we don't always say it, too. He'll say, well, I'm not sure that I really want to have kids. And she'll say, well, I think I really do. And then, you know, five years into the marriage, it's time to start a family. Right, but it's and he's saying, huge. I told you I didn't want kids. And she said, well, that's not really what I heard. And 
Right. And or, that becomes or, a huge or, or problem. A lot of people think they're going to change their spouse mm -hmm. uh, when they want something. Or let's take the value, some values or stealing, let's say. Mm -hmm. You, you know, you're absolutely not going to steal for the rest of your life or you're going to be honest and the other person doesn't see that as a value or a virtue. Yeah. I mean, I, these are examples, mm -hmm. I mean, they're extreme examples, but, uh, but, but you're saying that when you're young, you really, and you're in love, and how long does a love period last? It can oh. last a long time or the chemistry, that, that, I think, lasts for of, three months. That kind, but, well, that kind of love you're talking about and some of the... The, the blind love. Yeah, uh, it kind of maxes out at two to four years. It just... Oh, four years, because, it, okay. You know, it can last for a while, okay. um, but over time, that kind of love is replaced by uh, friendship, or a deeper attachment, right. a deeper connection. Uh, not that 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 adrenaline feeling uh, goes away completely, but it becomes the secondary feeling and the primary More feeling. Laid back. Is, is this? Yeah, this <laughs> this attachment I have to my partner. This is the person I like being with. Right. Um, you've said that uh, premarital counseling doesn't always work or it, it's not always useful is I'm, it the same reason that you know the same reason that, that you just mentioned I, I don't think we know why and as a minister I haven't given up on premarital counseling okay um, the research does tend to show that people who go through premarital counseling have about the same amount of divorce uh, and, and marital problems as people who don't so as far as um, as far as its effectiveness we haven't really been able to prove that However, I don't know that we've done everything that we can do okay. to in the premarital situ situation. Much of the premarital material that I've been exposed to over the years is, is based on compatibility. Right, Let's right. see how these people are compatible. But in terms of really dealing with things like their conflict management style, um, these deep core values right. or dreams that you're talking about, the the uh, a lot of the premarital stuff doesn't really get into that, and so I think we still have some things to learn there. So I'm not ready to give up on it okay. yet. Okay, um, let's talk about some of the things need people need to know about where there's some stress on a marriage. For example, your first baby. People don't think about this, but it does create a lot of stress in a marriage. You're right. A lot of people don't think about that, and they they only see the um, the wonder of having a new baby into the family, and it is a wonderful thing. But research shows that between two-thirds and three-fourths of couples start having more problems at the time of the first baby. There are reasons for that. People feel uh, that their energy that used to be turned toward each other now has it's to be turned here. Uh, spontaneity has is, is changed quite a bit, you know, where it used to be, what do you want to do? Well, let's go to the movie. We go. Right. And we have fun. We laugh about the movie. We go out and have dinner afterwards or whatever and just do that kind of in a very spontaneous way. That doesn't happen anymore when you've got an infant. So there are so many changes, there's so much fatigue, there's so much stress that, that couples go through that it oftentimes does tend to begin a process of, of distancing between uh, husband and wife. Uh, and a, it, a lot of times it doesn't show up right away because they're so focused on the baby, both of them, because uh, men, right, sure. fathers can be just as focused as moms. Uh, they're so focused on the baby and, and, and everything that has to be accomplished there that they're not really thinking about the fact that, hey, we're not as close as we used to be. Right. And I think that, uh, well, I know that a lot, of, uh, a lot of divorces actually have their roots back then, even if they don't appear for, you know, 10 or 12 years later. So how do you prevent them? And w it, it there are what good do you ways. Do? There, there are good ways. Uh, one of the books that I've really, uh, really treasured uh, and uh, kind of bought for some of my own uh, kids is uh, "And Baby Makes Three, which John uh, Gottman wrote uh, with his his wife Julie, and uh, who is also a, a, a psychologist and uh, in some ways is more my trainer than John. <laughs> um, and uh, they wrote this book together to talk about not necessarily how to be good parents. There's thousands of books like that. Some of that is in that book. But it's more how to be a good husband when you are a new parent. Oh, interesting. How to be a good wife when you're a new a parent. parent. There's even a workshop, which we don't teach here in Houston, but is taught throughout the country, to help those new uh, parents make that adjustment. Uh, to uh, It's called Bringing Baby Home. It's a wonderful little workshop uh, to help these uh, couples understand the processes that they're going through and to be more focused on how do, I, how do I be a good partner, a good wife, a good husband, while we're so wrapped up in raising uh, 
this new baby. And there are other critical periods that you mentioned that, that are tough on a marriage. Um, you said that the 15-year mark. The 15-year mark uh, tends to be a, a, a tough time, and sometimes that's, that one will catch people unaware. Um, the first one is in that four- to five-year mark where couples who are really into the four horsemen, mm -hmm. uh, they, they end up moving into the, that place of contempt and where they just end up sort of, I think, just melting down. Right. But there are couples whose marriages don't follow that track. Uh, instead of melting down, they, they kind of avoid the feelings. They avoid the problems. And, and uh, maybe they seek outside interest. You know, uh, uh, he gets involved in fishing or golf, and she gets involved in other things, and their life just begins to, to kind of separate. And then 10 or 15, you know, 15 or more years into the marriage, they, they start realizing that, that we're not connected at all. And they don't fight. You know, they, they don't really have outward conflicts that, that people see. And so sometimes people think, yeah, oh, why did they get divorced? Yeah, you're the yeah, ideal what couple. Uh, yeah. uh, you're the one that we all point to uh, right. because you never fight. You're never upset with each other. And they don't because there's not enough, there's not enough contact anymore. Okay. And uh, sometimes those marriages are very hard to help. Do you think that it's a good idea for couples to go to some sort of training once a year? I mean, is this something that we should all be doing if, if people who are married? I think so. Uh, once a year might be... Uh, Too much. Well, I don't Too know. Too much it, love. It depends on the couple. <laughs> uh, and a lot of our churches and other organizations are offering you know, marital enrichment workshops. Right, and right. those things are very... It's just a weekend. Yeah, I mean, they're, it's... They're, they're a weekend and they're very good. They are, those kind of workshops, however, are geared toward uh, improving the positive. They're, they're geared okay. toward enhancement. And they okay. say that real clear up front. Uh, this isn't a workshop for solving your marriage problems. This is a workshop for enhancing a good marriage. Um, the workshop we do actually does both. It has a day working right. on enhancement and then a day working on conflict. Um, and and but if a marriage is not struggling with a lot of conflict, I think that those enhancement experiences they, they can, can't be, hurt. They can be wonderful. Uh, explain something I thought was very interesting because of the research-based uh, marriage, um, the marriage research that you've done. The diffuse physiological arousal. This has to do with when you have a conflict with a spouse. When we're in conflict, um, our bodies can begin to change. Uh, we all have within us this, this uh, uh, general alarm system uh, that, that responds to danger. Uh, and when we get into conflict sometimes with our spouse and they begin to heat up, uh, our bodies start reacting to those as if we were under threat. Okay. It's the same kind of reaction that our ancestors might have had when they heard, uh, you know, a lion outside their their uh, home, um, and our bodies begin to uh, get ready to flee or to fight. Right. Uh, our muscles get tenser. Our our um, our brains even change. Our our brains, the the part of our brain that has a sense of humor and sees different perspectives and so on. A wonderful part of our brain, but it's kind of slow takes time to do that. Right. That sort of switches off or is inhibited and the parts of our brain that are, are really based on survival um, come, into, come into control. And in a marital conflict, when our bodies start making those changes and we start going into that um, diffuse physiological arousal, the ability to have a calm conversation, to see the other person's point of view, to be empathic, uh, to really listen is is very hard. Uh, instead, we want to fight back. We right. want to prove that we're right, that they're wrong, that they need to be quiet and listen to us. Right. And and, and uh, sometimes we even get very, you know, kind of, that's where we see a lot of the four horsemen at times. We get the, you know, people get belligerent with each other. Um, and the only thing that really works there that we know of is taking the time to calm down, uh, to do do something to help your brain get back on track, to help your body get back to normal, to get the pulse rate down, to allow time for our kidneys to process the adrenaline right. out of our blood so that we can begin to talk with each other again uh, in, in a calm way. So what are the three things that we need to remember about marriage? I think we need to remember, first of all, we need to be good friends with our partner. We also need to learn how to have a softer approach when something's bothering us, a softer approach to our conflicts. And then we also need to kind of have an idea of we that we're working together toward a plan, toward
toward the future, toward a goal that defines who we are as a couple. I like what you said about friendship because uh, that, that's really the key really to a long-term relationship. It is it's not everything else. I mean, sex is important and, and the love is important, but really you, you have to have a great friendship. Um, how do you know you're living smart? I think I feel most that I'm living smart when I know that I'm in good relationship with people who are around me, especially people who are important to me, my wife, my kids, my coworkers, people like that, but also in general that I have an attitude of uh, treating other people the way I want to be treated, um, calming my own anger down, and trying to be friendly with people. And joy, right? Don't you have to have a lot of joy I think in that's a good where, marriage? I mean, that's whatever kind of where, brings you joy. Yeah, that's where joy comes from. It really it comes from that sense of belonging together. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Cole. It's great to have you here. Thank you. And to learn more about emotionally intelligent marriages, go to our website. There you'll find a complete resource list. You can also email us or call us with your comments at 713-743-8513. And that's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to live smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a joyful week. Thank you. For a transcript of this program, send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.